Hey friends, welcome to 80s Do TV. I'm your host, John, and we're going to embark on a hero's journey together in this retrospective about one of the most iconic cult classics of the 1980s. The film I'm hyping you up about is none other than the Motown martial arts gem, The Last Dragon from 1985. Now this retrospective, it's going to be a little different as I brought on a special guest and important voice for the film to discuss the 13 things you didn't know about The Last Dragon. Craig Sutton is the man behind The Last Dragon Tribute, an online collection of all things The Last Dragon, as well as the dude behind The Last Glow social media page on Instagram. And it covers everything about The Last Dragon, so make sure you check that out. Now, his access to the actors and the screenwriter and crew will give us a deeper insight about this amazing film that has meant so much to many of us over the years. A couple of things before uh, we kick things off. I've cut a special section of this interview and placed it at the end of this retrospective. So make sure that you stick around at the end and watch and listen to the exchange between Craig and I as we speak about what this film meant to us and share a little bit more, a few more nuggets with you. Also, please make sure to visit the video description below for the links for his archive and social media page. And while you're there, make sure that you're following this channel for more videos just like this. Now listen, I want you to go grab a bowl of popcorn and your favorite drink, kick back and relax, and let's dive into the world of The Last Dragon. The Last Dragon is a 1985 martial arts comedy film directed by Michael Schultz and produced by Rupert Hitzig for Barry Gordy. The film stars Tymok, Vanity, Julius Carey, Christopher Murney, Keisha Knight Pulliam, and Faith Prince. Set in New York City, the movie follows a martial artist named Leroy Green, also known as Bruce Leroy, who dreams of becoming a legendary martial artist like his idol, Bruce Lee. His master explains that he has reached the final level of martial arts accomplishment, knowing without knowing, a journey in the cycle of the last dragon. Martial artists who reach the final level are said to be able to concentrate mystic energy into their hands, causing them to glow. The film is a mix of martial arts, romance, and layered with a wonderful mix of music from Gordy's Motown label, including DeBarge's hit song, Rhythm of the Night, written by Diane Warren, and songs from Stevie Wonder, Smokey Robinson, and the film star, Vanity, who we also know as Denise Matthews. The Last Dragon was a financial success despite mixed reviews from critics and is considered a cult classic today. For those of you that have seen The Last Dragon, my hope is you learn a few new things about the film and its production and cast that make it even more enjoyable for you. And for those of you that have yet to see it, that this video makes you excited to see the film right away and share it with your community. The Last Dragon was heavily inspired by the martial arts legend Bruce Lee. Uh, the film's protagonist, Leroy Green, played by Ty Mock, is a devoted student of Bruce Lee's philosophy and martial arts style. While I don't feel you needed to have seen The Chinese Connection or Enter the Dragon or Game of Death, I believe that if you did, though, you would appreciate this movie so much more. Do you agree with that? Absolutely, yeah. Like when you see those themes, like I remember when I was first watching those Bruce Lee movies, it, you, you had that same thing. It was like, why won't he fight? Why does he fight? Like, he, at first, he always held back, you know, and he didn't want to fight, and he he let things go until it progressed. Till he's like, now I have to. You, you've hurt my family. You've insulted my family. I need to do something now. It was always it had to be serious. He wasn't just going to fight for the fun of it or for ego. It was because it came down to defending his family. And this movie follows that that same theme. And, and so in the Chinese connection, obviously there's a lot of things that are pulled out of that. There's a, there's so many things that are actually homage to the yeah. Chinese connection or to Bruce Lee's, um, a Bruce Lee homage in the last dragon. I think on your website, the last dragon tribute, you guys make sure you check it out. Amazing website, a collection of everything that Craig's experience and feedback and, and communications are all on there. I mean, it is a treasure trove. Uh, and uh, I know you had an article about all the homages that are paid to, um, the Chinese connection to Bruce Lee and that that sort of thing. So there's a poster of Bruce Lee, Enter Dragons in the movie. He is a massive fan of Bruce Lee and wants to be Bruce Lee. But then you've got like the funny version of Bruce Lee, which is Johnny Yu. <laughs> and he yeah. actually almost yeah. word for word quotes some of the lines from Fist of Fury, right? Like, all yeah. right, hold it. <laughs> you know, when Bruce Lee he stops everyone in that movie, he's like, we've had enough, you know? You want to fight? Uh, fight me. <laughs> fight me. I love it. Yeah, 
Primark was not the first choice for Bruce Leroy. I thought yeah. about this a lot over the years. There were several choices for the role of Bruce Leroy, I believe. I, I've heard that Wesley Snipes wanted the role, Lawrence Fishburne. I've even heard Denzel Washington's name thrown around. Can you confirm if this is true and what other insights you have on the subject? And I've heard that Time Lock was not the first Bruce Leroy and someone else was actually picked for the role. So mm -hmm. can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so the the role was in high demand because people knew this was Barry Gordy produced. It had Motown money behind it. It was an opportunity for a either a black or a Latino, what they were looking for, someone of color to lead a big film. So, and they were going out to martial arts tournaments. They, it was like a countrywide search. So you can imagine every leading or not even man at that time wanted this role. So. I can't confirm or deny that absolutely Denzel, Redford, and Wesley Snipes, but I just imagine that those were Denzel was a top guy around then, that he would have definitely been presented the opportunity to be a part of this. I know for a fact Mar Mario Van Peebles was considered because Louis Van Osten wow. was friends with him. The writer was friends with him, and he sort of envisioned Mario Van Peebles as being Leroy, the look. Okay, right? interesting. And then he also thought of... Uh, Billy Billy Blanks, the Taibo guy. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He was one of the only black at the time. Like there was guys before. There's Jim Kelly. There was um, Ron Van Cleef from the past. Yeah. But at that time, you know, King of the King Boxer and that stuff. I, that, I'm not sure the date around that time. But he was he was well known. So it, that was also in his head. I don't know if he actually tried out for the part or not. But it was definitely in the thought process. Like. Well, if this was going to get made, it would probably be a guy like like Billy Blanks. It sure. would be somebody like Mario Van Peebles. If we could combine those two, the martial arts skill of, and strength of Billy Blanks with the look and the acting of Mario Van Peebles, that would be our guy. So, uh, sure. But what yeah. I can say for sure is it is true that Timok was not the first choice. He wasn't an actor. Okay. He was a really legit martial artist. He had won. He had just won the New York State Kickboxing Championships. Um, you know, when the, when that arrow, those arrows, you hear the rumors of the arrows being shot at him and him really chopping them out. Of the, he was doing that. You know, they were, they weren't, they were soft arrows. They weren't, you know, they wouldn't sure. kill them if they hit them. They were, yeah. sorry, they were real arrows, but they were blunted down at the end. So they couldn't really right. hit him. Right. But he did, boom, catch that one out of the air. You know, that's real. He's legit, very legit. And he still is. Awesome. And, um, <clears throat> but he hadn't done any acting at all. So when he first went to read for the part, he thought he was going to do a martial arts exhibit because they wanted to see what he had. But it wasn't martial arts at all. It was straight, like, you know, a, a, a real read. And he had no clue what he was doing. Right. So he was uncomfortable. He had no confidence. And he did. He blew it. He, he, in his own words, he said it was a total mess. He was awful. He walked out of there. He came in so excited because all his friends said, this role's perfect for you. You're a good looking guy. You're martial artist black. This is you. you this character is right. you. And then he just left with his tail between his legs. And they actually gave the role to somebody else. And that actor's name was uh, Van Silk. So you don't hear that that often. You hear, you know, that it was given to someone that maybe you heard that, but his name was Van Silk. So, okay. but Timok went on a trip with his dad and his best friend. And his dad was given a hard time. Like, you got to work hard. And he was a hard guy. And um, he wanted to practice and practice. And, and Timok did not want to practice, but... His friend pulled him aside and was like, listen, if there's a God out there, this role was written for you. You need to take advantage of the situation. So him and his buddy worked on it. His dad helped. They practiced and practiced and practiced because he still had the script. And then he went back to wherever it was, New York, California, probably New York, knocked on the door. Yeah, I think it was New York. Yeah, yeah they knocked yeah. on the door and he said, they said, hey, we already got somebody. He's like, no, I want to try. And he just... Like in the movie, you know, boom, kick down the door, you know. That's I want awesome. to see it now. I want to see the master now. And yeah. he basically he gave it his all, and they loved it. And they, um, the other guy hadn't yet signed. They picked him, but they hadn't signed. So they're wow. like, yours. They gave it to him. So we almost got a different you know, That's crazy. And I, I've come to believe that the role was meant for Time Up. Over the years, I, I know I hear this and that and different things, but I believe that he was the right guy for yeah. this film and despite his not having any acting history his innocence and, and naivety and yeah. like it shines through in his character and it's natural yeah. and that's what you love about bruce leroy that's yeah. the thing that's why you root for him and uh, you know 
do I think we would have had a different movie with Denzel? You know, sure. Yeah, yeah, he probably would have given every bad guy nine seconds and, <laughs> and, uh, and it would have been over, you know, it had been, been called the last equalizer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so, yeah. but, but I just think Ty Mock, to his credit, Ty Mock really shines in this film. I, I, I really liked him as a kid, especially when you're watching Ty Mock, you so associate yourself with him and then, yeah. and that, that type of person. He's just a good person who's trying to figure things out and he nails it in my opinion. Yeah, I think he was the right guy for sure. I totally agree. Yeah, yeah his his um, naiveness, innocence, it's it was important to the role. Yeah. For sure. Right. <laughs> Whitney Houston audition for the role of Laura Charles. What? Yeah, so this Tell is this, this is breaking news. I just heard this. So Louis Venosa <laughs> just told me that because he just found out. So, because he was talking with his old girlfriend, who the character of Laurel Charles was actually based on. So his girlfriend okay. name was Joy. I guess she was an actress at the time. And uh, all of the characters were based on Louis Venosa's friends, which is later going to come out too. We'll talk about that later. So I'll have to come back because there's more to be said. Yeah, yeah, we'll no. Do it all the way yeah. now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Louis Venosa has been telling me some really cool stories. So his ex-girlfriend told him, that while he while she was auditioning for the part, which she didn't get, even though the role was made for her, <laughs> she um, <laughs> she saw Whitney Houston in the room waiting for her wow. audition. So wow, yeah. <laughs> that blows my mind, man. I mean, Whitney Houston. This would be a def definitely a different right? Whitney Houston is a great act. Was a great actress, you know. Uh, rest in peace. Yes. And um, but definitely a different type of style. I think that they picked the right Laura Charles. Yeah, um, I, even I though I'm too. a huge fan of Whitney Houston. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, it would have been it would have been different. Like, and she's just she was huge at the time too. I mean, everyone knows her now, and but there's a reason why everyone knows her now because she was massive in the '80s. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. an interesting uh, piece of information. I love that. I... Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and go to number four. The film launched many careers. We talked, we brushed on this a little bit, but. Let's talk about um, some of the careers that it launched. There were some some uh, actors in there that were either it was their first role or maybe they'd done a, a film or two maybe before that, a small part, but they began to really do big things like in the late 80s and 90s and so on. And and yeah. so let's just uh, maybe you can pull out a few and, and share them. Yeah. So, of, co of course, we've got uh, Keisha Knight Pulliam, who is uh, Rudy on The Cosby Show. She was a little sister with like three, four names. Sophia yeah. Lotus Blossom Natasha. Lotus Blossom. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love There's, that. of course, uh, William H. Macy in there as yeah. JJ. Um, yeah. He was like the the production manager on the set of The Seventh Heaven. Yeah. Um, uh, Chaz Palminteri, is, uh, he was the yep. driver, the limo driver, one of the thugs. And he yeah. did, uh, Bruce Leroy beats up after they try to um, uh, kidnap Laura Charles. Um, Faith Prince, obviously we talked about, she went on to do big things. So after she walked out on Eddie Arcady to go to elocution class. Now, if you're unhappy with all this, why don't you just walk out? It really worked out well for her. She yeah. won Broadway <laughs> success. She yeah, won, awesome. uh, yeah, I mean, that speech she gives, we talked about it. It's incredible, right? Like, yeah. and, and I talked to the actors that are involved in that, and they all, their jaws all dropped when they watched her do that. They oh, all man. said... This might be, and it was her first movie. They, they all said, this girl is serious. Like she's sitting there with all this Cindy Lauper hairstyle goop, total joke, but then bam, she drops that. And everybody was like, wow, this girl is going yeah. for this. She's and she got acting jobs for sure. She won a Tony on Broadway. Um, so yeah, she worked out well for her. Love of course, it. there's um, Mike Starr from who went on, to, who played Rock. Uh, yep. Went on to uh, Goodfellas and um, Dumb and Dumber. You probably know him from. Yeah. Uh, Ernie Reyes Jr. He's the little guy. The um, Last Electric Night. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Love the Last Electric Night. When I was a kid, I always thought the Last Electric Night was like some type of continuation of the same universe as yeah. the Last Dragon. Because yeah, of likewise. the electricity likewise. and the glow, and obviously he was in both in both movies and. You know, people yep. might remember it was also called Sidekicks after. They did Sidekicks. a movie called The Last Electric Night. And then the, the you know, I know you know, you know everything yeah. about the movie. <laughs> and Sidekicks was the show with um, Gil Gerard from Buck Rogers. 
was yeah. the uh, those yeah. were the two posts. I, I love that show actually. I did oh, a good. Instagram post on that, and people were like, "Oh man, uh, you know, nostalgia, you yeah. know, overload, overload on that." You know? Overload because it's yeah. one of those shows that people forget, but when they see yeah. it, they're like, "Oh yeah, I remember that. It was great." Yeah, yeah. and um, Don yeah. Cheadle was in the, the the pilot of that. He was like, "Yeah, the- I know. <laughs> I, I actually that." That was the episode I posted, was the one with Don Cheadle. Don't hurt him. He's an old man. Start kicking. Yeah, yeah and then Ernie Reyes Jr., of course, he, he's been working since then. Like, he was in, back yeah. then, he was in Red Sonja. He was one of the turtles in TMT, and then they gave him a, his own role, yep. a Kino, later on. He was in certain yeah, I didn't movies. even know. I didn't know he had an Instagram page, and then I followed him on that. Um... And there's a few of, of the actors that were in this film that actually have Instagram pages I wasn't even aware of. Well, cool. Um, so, yeah, but that's that's awesome. Yeah, he was in the rundown with The Rock. Like, he's just yeah. always working. He went through some yeah. issues with his kidneys. Uh, he still is on dialysis all the time, but he's much. He's doing way better now. Oh. He's healthy. He's wow. doing good. So well, he good. got a little scared there, but he's doing well now. Um, wow. there's, there's also another is Carl Payne. Who we might know from he was he was cockroach on the Cosby Show and then he also played Cole on uh, on Martin. Martin, Martin, yeah. I yeah. love that show, man. I used to watch that all the time. <laughs> and then of course um, Leo O'Brien, who played the little brother Richie, was uh, he passed away, you know, 2012. But he was in all after the Last Dragon. He was in New Jack City. He was in a movie called Rappin' Hood film. with Mario mm-hmm. Van Peebles, and yeah. um, he was also part of the Sugar Hill Gang. Which a lot I didn't of know that. Knew. Yeah, his okay. brother is Master G, who was like the, the head of it. And he was a DJ. Okay. So he was, okay. he was a DJ. So if you go back <laughs> to some old clips, uh, there's like an wow. ABC like news story on like the birth of hip hop. And Leo O'Brien is actually in it rapping. So it's like it's like the first time hip hop hit the mainstream news. And Leo O'Brien's like front and center. And, wow. you know, wow. and he was in like, I have on my Instagram, like he was in underoos commercials and cereal commercials and stuff. Like he was an up and coming young guy. And then, you know, things just didn't work out for That's him. That's so sad. Yeah. And yeah. I was going to tell you that he was one of my favorite characters in this uh, I, movie I as well. Like too, yeah. yeah. He was really, he was a great kind of like foil for, uh, yeah. for uh, Bruce Leroy, you know? So the lost script, uh, the, the myth about a big chunk of the script being erased. You've spoken to the uh, creator of The Last Dragon, uh, Venosta. So mm-hmm. um, has he shared any thoughts with you about, you know, what he thought about the movie and the script? Any, like, script secrets he shared with you by any chance? Oh, a lot. Yeah, a lot. And there's, I talk to him. I talk to him pretty often nowadays, actually. I mean, I asked him about, like, there's a myth that him and the director, Michael Schultz, one night, they were asked to cut out, like, $2 million worth of budget or some figure, 200000 or something, right? Which isn't true. And um, they went, they were going through the script and they were trying to cut it down. And then uh, Louis Venosa, the writer, fell asleep and Michael Schultz erased a big chunk of the, of the script. That's the myth. Yeah. And woke up yeah. and woke up Louis and was like, oh my God, I, I ruined it. I erased all these pages. We got to do something. And then they spent you know, the next day, like retyping stuff. And we don't know what was lost. Like, that's the myth. Like every good myth and legend, it does come from the truth. So sure. they were told to cut down the script because it was the runtime was too long. It wasn't a money thing. It was just runtime, which can turn into money. So that makes yeah, sense. Of course. But um, but all they did is they went in and took out kind of like the stage directions in the script. And that made it like way shorter. So they'd be like, where it had it would describe the whole fight scene between Leroy and Shonuff, da da da, blow for blow, and they're just like instead of having a page, it would be just say Leroy fights Shonuff, and that's that. And yeah. now, you know, it's <laughs> smart, smart, so, smart. That's great. But they yeah. did, and then the other part of it is that they did erase the entire script on an old Commodore sixty four, and this is when computers were first starting getting used, so. If you didn't save yeah. something and you worked on it, right, it was gone. It's over. You know? It's over. And basically, Michael Schultz was using a computer for the first time, and he was going through the script to clean some stuff up, and he did. He he hit power and hadn't saved it, so wow. it was gone. Wow. But they had paper copies. Lewis yeah. had – he had backup drives. It wasn't gone. Good. He still had it. Yeah. But they did have to retype the whole script. So uh, there's a lot of truth in there, but in the end, yeah. nothing was really lost. And they did take the script back to the studio and they said, see, it's shorter now. 
And the funny part is they're like, you ruined it. What have you done? And they literally, they look for other writers. They're like, you ruined it. You're wow. done. We're going to go look for another. And they, they pass it around to other writers. And so other writers came in, rewrote it, reworked it, did all this stuff to try to make it better. Then now they were mad because they were like, this isn't the same. The whole movie's ruined. So they went back to Lewis, the original writer, and said, you've got to save us. Everything's to, gone to crap now wow. since you changed it. And so all he did is took the backup copy he had and submitted the exact old script. And they said, you're the savior. Thank God. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's the executives for you, though, right? Like, Man, you don't like that's a great. That, you know, yeah, they didn't yeah, change that, anything. And then they went back I to know. the original anyway. <laughs> What an incredible story. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Cut scenes and ad libs. Were any scenes cut from the film that you're aware of? Uh, and if so, why? Yeah. So well, I've heard not much. Like one of the, I can't remember who I was talking to, but they were first saying that like pretty much everything that was filmed that was used. But I've done some digging and this isn't completely true. So... <laughs> Um, I talked to Lisa Dalton, who played the taller one of Shonuff's girls, the tall one, you know. Yeah, the, she's, the, great. Uh, she's great. Yeah, the uh, one of her ad libs actually was the "I'd like to peel this banana." That was. Yeah. Her. I would love to peel this banana. <laughs> she made up that line when she saw the yellow outfit. So, so yeah. there was a lot. There was. A, we'll get into that too. There was a lot of ad libbing. Like they really let the the, the actors. They knew it. They said, like, listen, this is like a comic book come to life. Have fun. You don't have to follow yeah. the lines to a T. And I think some guys like uh, Christopher Murney, who was a great actor, did a great job as Eddie Arcadian. He was really like, hey, this isn't this isn't Shakespeare. Like, right. let's have fun. And I think he set the tone <laughs> for that. And he was yeah. just coming up with stuff left and right. And I love him it. And, him and Mike Starr. What the hell is this guy? We didn't know it around. Like, just had a ball making this movie. And That's they were great. just coming up with lines back and forth. Uh, but yeah. getting back to the scene, so Lisa Dalton told me that when Shona first comes in the movie theater and they all come in as all the henchmen came in, it's it's similar to the scene in Enter the Dragon on Han's Island when um, Han throws up, I think it's an apple, he throws it up in the air and one of the girls throws a dart right yep. through it and then uh, Bruce Lee catches it, gotcha. takes the dart out and then takes a bite, right? Yeah. And so it was, it was mimicked off of that. So somebody, show enough, says something, and somebody throws up a K Kentucky Fried Chicken leg up in the air, and uh -huh. Lisa's character takes a dart out of her headband and, and nails the, uh, the fried chicken, and, and oh, she yeah. catches it. So they ended up cutting that out. Whoa. But it also explains why, if you watch it, you watch the order of the henchmen and hench girls when they come in, they're... At first, it's mixed. You know, there's guys and girls mixed together on both sides of the right. aisles. And then when they cut back, one side's girls and one side's guys. It's girls changed. Yeah. The continuity there is messed up because they cut that scene out. Got so it. That, that's why it's like, whoa, people don't notice that kind of stuff, but I'm sure you probably I did. love it. I love it. <laughs> that explains yeah, that's, that's so awesome. And one of my favorite lines was, who the hell is this guy? We didn't order out. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. That, was a, that was an ad lib too. That was something that... <laughs> Mike Starr started it. Rock, he was the one who came up with it. And they kept telling him, no, no, don't say that. It's kind of, it's insulting or it's not right. <laughs> and then, but like, but uh, Christopher Murney was like, whatever. And he just, yeah. he said it and they used it and they loved, they loved it. The way he did it, they, they pulled it off. So another album awesome. there. Yeah. So That's awesome. the other scene that was cut out was, um, I've heard Carl, Carl Payne talk about it, um, who actually auditioned to play Richie. Um, didn't get it, um, but they liked him, so they, they kept him on as one of his friends. He said there was a whole scene where they were playing video games in somebody's living room or something, and uh, he didn't know. He's like, well, that's the first time I learned that uh, your whole you know your whole movie, the stuff that you did can completely get removed from a movie. He's like, I don't want to get, you know, and they don't tell you. He's like, I went to the premiere expecting to see, I had all my friends expecting to see myself. I'm, I'm there for like five seconds. <laughs> He's like, what? Where did I go? <laughs> well, yeah, so it would have been interesting to see what, what was actually going on there. So, yeah. So, so tell me about uh, Glenn Eaton's line, uh, the string being Rick James looking fool. Right. Okay. So that, um, Glenn Eaton had, um, a lot of his stuff was ad lib too, because, so he was a first time actor. He'd never done anything. The reason he got the role was that his sister, 
was dating Barry Gordy. So, <laughs> so he, got, he just got thrown in there because she was like, oh, you got to see this guy. He's funny. He does a oh, perfect man. Bruce Lee impersonation. You got to see this guy. So they brought him in and gave him a chance. And so he always felt all sorts of pressure to, um, to perform, right? He's super nervous. So in yeah. that scene in the dojo, um, they said to him, you know, they gave him a line from the script. And they didn't like the reaction he was getting from, uh, I believe would have been Shonuff or Beast. I can't remember. Probably Shonuff. He wasn't getting the reaction. So Barry Gordy pulled him aside and he said, you say this and this and this. And he goes, oh. and it was, it was more, it was, it was harsher. It was like, it was cursing right. And he goes, I don't want to get fired. Do you think I can say it? He goes, yeah. he's like, to Barry Gordy. He's like, I guess if Barry yeah. Gordy says, okay, it's okay. So he went out there and he delivered it with much more gusto. Uh, the oh, yeah. so I think he edited the swears, but, he might even yeah. the first time use the swears. I'm not sure. But sure enough, was like, mm, you know, he got the reaction he wanted. And so they used it. You want to fight? You fight me. How about you? Stream being Rick James looking fool. I got to admit that that is like one of my probably my top five favorite lines of the whole film. Yeah, uh, it, it's so good. I sometimes use it on people. So yeah. it's like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, cool. Cool. Well, speaking of um, of Glen Eaton. So, I mean, Lee Eaton was a lot like Johnny Yu, right? You you shared with me that maybe there was a story uh, yeah. about Lynn Eaton or something that happened to him that you might yeah. want to share. Well, so what's crazy is that a lot of people wonder if he's if like or they think that he knows martial arts, but he actually knew no martial arts, no training. He took a little boxing, but what he was, what he loved Bruce Lee, and he had like posters. You know, and he didn't have like video to watch. So he would literally look at pictures of Bruce Lee and like try to mimic how he looked and whatever. And we all did, right? We all right? Did. So he was yeah. he was literally a kid who impersonated Bruce Lee, who then got a job acting like a Bruce Lee character that's, in a movie. That's and crazy. the whole scene about him being the master of fighting without no without knowing how to fight, which is built off of a Bruce Lee saying, you know, fight yeah. without fighting. Yeah. That actually happened to him. So he got jumped by a bunch of guys, and he literally, he same thing, all confidence, no skills. He was yeah. literally like, all right, he gave him a kung fu stance, and he was like, so what's it going to be? All of you together, or one at a time? <laughs> and they were like, what the heck? And they left him alone. <laughs> Johnny, what are you doing? I mastered the art of fighting without knowing how to fight. <laughs> That's so great, like, man. He used that like bravado and gusto in, in the movie. I so love it. He's, I he's love literally it. like that. Like he could do all the moves and he really did the nunchucks. And that was another ad lib that he they added to the film is that him with the nunchucks wasn't really set up. He just, he brought the nunchucks and Barry Gordy again pulled him aside. He was like, what are you doing over here? Get out there and do something, you know? what can you do? And he's like, uh, show him something. You can do some nunchucks. And he's like, all right. And he grabbed some nunchucks and he started, and he could really do that just from what, again, from watching. And he had a buddy, he said he had a Korean buddy who taught him how to do it. Right. And so he went up That's there and awesome. did it and they loved it. And they used it. Really I love cool. it. I love it. I'm going to go on a little tangent here. This is something interesting. First of all, remember when I said to you that he could have his own um, series, yeah. The movie I was referring to was called They Call Me Bruce. It was oh. a 1982 film, yes, and it was yeah. it starred Johnny Yoon. And, yes, uh, yes, and that yes. film, I absolutely – I loved it. I loved yeah. it. But that's so funny because his name is Johnny Yu. Is yeah, the last I, wonder if, in I wonder if it's it's a little uh, homage yeah, or, or based I, I, on that. Yeah. I wonder. you got you got to ask Lewis about yes. that. But anyway, so that's cool. And then the other thing I was going to say, you said nunchucks, and that just reminded me. I heard – I was traveling not too long ago and I was talking about the last dragon with this person. And they told me that that film was banned for a long time yeah, in the UK. Right. Yeah. Um, because I guess they have something about against nunchucks there and, uh, in their laws and things like that. So no one had seen the last dragon for a, like they either never seen it, never heard of it or whatever, because of this, is this crazy? Have you heard about this? Yeah. So it's, I still think they put it out in England, but they cut the scenes, any scenes with nunchucks, they cut out. So every, oh, okay. every martial arts movie that get released over there, they'd have to cut out because it was against the law 
to show people using nunchucks on screen. Like here, like in a commercial, you can't drink a beer. Like you can't actually drink it, right? You can pour it, but that's why they yeah. never saw you drinking. Same thing. They're right. Like, yeah, you can't okay. shut it. Got to cut that okay. out. Yeah, this is one of those wow, things. Wow, wow. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, so I told this person I was going to send them a, uh, a copy of uh, The Last Dragon, like with the nunchucks in it. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> right. What's with the sum dumb goy? I am looking for the master. Ain't no masters here, dude. Ain't no slaves either. <laughs> What's with yeah. those guys? Without, to me, without these guys, we wouldn't have the disguise scene similar to what we saw in the Chinese Connection, like where Bruce Lee was the telephone repairman. That w here, though, it kind of flips on its head. Bruce Leroy is uh, disguised as Soul Brother Number One, uh, and so, so tell me about that. What, have you talked to these guys? Uh, are they still around? Are all three of them around? Is did one of them pass away? Can you share a little information on the some dumb goy guys? Yeah, so I've met two of them. I've met Henry Yuck and uh, Michael Chin, who still act. They're still acting now. They've done okay. a ton of stuff. If you watch um, the Dave Chappelle show, you remember there was a, one yeah. episode, one of the best ones, the racial draft, where they okay. picked the two guys. Um, uh, Henry Yuck was it Henry. Yeah, it was Henry Yuck was actually the lead of the Asian delegation. If you watch. Okay. So I'm gonna write this different. down. I don't think I've seen that. Yeah, so he looks a little different, but his face is still the same. You'll see it right away. You'll be, oh my god, how did I miss that? When people watch it, they don't know, they don't realize it. But if knowing it, okay. you'll be like, holy cow, that's him. So, <laughs> and um, Michael Chin's been in a bunch of. They've both been in a bunch of stuff. They they know martial arts, so they've done. They do stunts and they do acting. So like he was in some of the Marvel shows that are on Netflix. Um, okay. background characters and you know line line here and there that sort of thing so they're both still acting i've met the two of them the other guy lives he lives in hong kong his name's fred and i've never met him but he's still still going strong and he's in hong kong right on it's funny is uh these guys i think they were like named after the donald duck uh, yes. nephews huey louie and dewey you know yeah. Yeah. um so just some interesting thing I, I feel like we need a Johnny U movie with the Some Dumb Goy guys in it too. It's like yeah, but that so. yeah, and they were um, and they were actually supposed to act more like stereotypically Chinese. Like they were supposed to speak with broken English okay. and be giving them a hard time, or whatever. Um, but Barry Gordy again stepped in and said, you know, I, I think it'd be funny. It'd be good if these guys were jive talking. And, yeah, uh, you know that makes and, to me that makes sense. I think today and and anybody who's young younger generation that's going to be watching this or is watching this, like if you were Asian, you were dressing up. Maybe you were in the hip hop culture or both, yeah. uh, African American culture, black culture. You were dressing up like that, and vice versa. There, I would walk down in Detroit and I would see black dudes wearing um, uh, martial arts clothing or like yeah. asian clothing yeah, that like, stuff is real people, people that's not like, that who does that but it was real yeah that actually yeah. happened and yeah and quite frankly there was a number of years for me where i was absolutely fascinated with japanese culture and i was into having japanese things clothing and things like that like i think we all did that at yeah. one point we appreciated other yeah. people's cultures you know what i mean well that's what i was going to say there's a thin line between appropriation and appreciation right Appre yeah right Good and point. if it's done out yeah. of res respectfully and not in a yeah. satirical or making fun of or a derogatory way it's appreciation that's right, right? appreciation um, but then when, exactly but then when you want to take credit for somebody else's work you know and they get a c on it or they fail for what they did but you get an <laughs> a by taking it and, and putting a mainstream spin on it that's where you got a problem right yeah so yep, that's, totally, that, totally. that's why i understand both sides of that conversation but i think when the last dragon does it especially back then it really is an appreciation because Agreed. everyone is involved in this movie too like you know there's yep. all sorts of cultures and respect for what has come before that's right i love that well said well said <laughs> Eddie Arcadian's tank, man. What's in that tank? Yeah. Is it an eel? Is it piranhas? Is it what? What is, what is it? Right. Some people think, well, like, obviously it was piranhas, but if you, whenever they talk about it, they call it a thing, like that. It's one thing, right? And then yeah. you see it swim by, you see a little fin and some stuff. You're like, looks like one yeah. thing. And yeah. um, who knows? It'll all, probably yeah. always be a mystery. But <laughs> what I do know for sure is that what was really in there was a pipe. They had a pipe to make like the bubbles and stuff, and so. Yeah. You can see when um, when Eddie Arcadian gets his head pulled out of the water, he's got a cut right here on his eyebrow. And it's yes. there, it's gone, you know, depending on how they filmed it. But right when he comes out, there's a cut. 
it's because he actually banged his face on a pipe that was in the water to make the bubbles. Wow. So that's what was he actually. Gotten really in, he could have oh. gotten really injured. He could have really <laughs> injured. Wow. Yeah. wow. And, but, you know, Christopher Murney, you know, <laughs> You know, got, good guy that he is, just continued yeah. on. He went right with it. He didn't stop and go, like, ah, oh, I'm bleeding. But he just yeah. carried on, right? It's a good job. I love it. I love it. Oh, All right. well, that reminds me of one thing we didn't talk about. There's a scene in the movie where he gives, presents shown up with a briefcase of, of money. Right. right. And he's wearing a toupee, right? And then he's not yeah. wearing it for the rest of the movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it just disappears. Yeah. yeah. So they were like, in the beginning, he was going to wear a toupee, and then later on, they didn't. And they're like, oh, my gosh, we forgot. We filmed this one scene. We have to redo it. And he's yeah. like, ah, who cares? Leave it in there. Like, <laughs> this is not the kind of movie that people are going to care. Like, just leave yeah. it. It's just one of those things that's funny. It's like, wait a second. Why does he have hair? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Julius Carey's method acting has shown up on the set. I heard there were some antics and things like that. Can you share something about that? Yeah, so he, yeah, he was in character, I guess, the entire time. <laughs> and so, and he was doing this as well to get the most out of his, his coworkers, the other actors, right? And Tymok being a first time actor didn't quite get this, but um, you know, he liked Julius Carey, who was playing show enough. And, 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 and Julius saw this and he needed to bring something out more. He needed to bring out the fear in him. Right. So, and he'd walk around the set and there'd be a sign up and he'd like knock it down and he'd say, who put this there? And what is this madness? You know, he's just <laughs> carrying on. And like, he gave all the, all the henchmen, the nicknames they have in the movie. He gave them those nicknames. He's like, okay, that's awesome. Here's you, you're crunch, you know, you're cyclone. <laughs> and he gave, apparently he gave the girls nicknames too. Um, but I okay. guess they, were, they didn't use them in the movie because they were, uh, I think a few of them are a little crude. So oh, okay. they couldn't use them. <laughs> but one, one thing that Time Mark told me before, and I've got it, posted on my site in a, in a, a YouTube video about it. But he was antagonizing Ty Mock so much that that Ty got ticked off and he got really mad at him. And then sure enough realized that, oh, he pushed him over the edge and he actually, like Ty was gonna like fight him. And he's like, you know, he's a huge guy. He's like six, seven. And he's wearing this wig right. and all these yeah. shoulder pads. He was a skinny guy, but he had this big shoulder pad. So he looked yeah. massive, but he was actually quite thin and couldn't really fight. So. right. Tymok was like, mm, and he, he's like, oh crap. And he ran for it. <laughs> so you can just imagine this giant guy running from Tymok, who's oh. he's like 5'11, 6 feet tall, but he looks tiny yeah. compared to enough. So you can imagine like yeah. this little guy chasing this big oh, man. through the set all over. So like, good. Oh, he's, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. That's too good. Too good. Yeah. So uh, I also heard that, um, that he would tease Vanity quite a bit. Right. Yeah. So Vanity had a new album that she was releasing and she would play it for everyone and she'd always play it for Julius and Julius would be like, nah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he was just doing it on purpose. He would literally be saying it to her while he's winking at, at, uh, I heard Mike Starr, Mike Starr, Mike Starr told the story and, um, he was just, and like Mike Starr just, he's been in so many movies. It's hilarious yeah. to hear him yeah. have so many fond memories of this movie. He Love loved it. it. He loved That's working awesome. with, with, uh, with Christopher Murney. And like, he has so many great stories. Like, I would like to interview him sometime. Or you should interview him because he will go on for days. He, Absolutely. You know? I, I will. I will definitely. I've got a list of folks I want to reach out to. Maybe have you broker the whole thing for yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So let's talk about, <clears throat> and we'll talk about how the cast and crew love the film in yeah. just a minute here. But let's talk <laughs> Martial arts legit legitimacy. Uh, there were real legit world class martial artists and fight coordinators on the film. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, briefly? so this movie was a really big deal in the martial arts community, <laughs> and it still is now. It has a huge following in the martial arts community. Like I've been to Detroit for shows. We we brought the actors there, and like the martial art arts community came out on mass. When I go to New York for reunions and uh, well, the Urban Action Showcase they do every year, there's so many martial arts there that have were inspired by The Last Dragon. So at the time, this was a huge deal. And they flew in guys from all over. So that big fight scene in Seventh Heaven is just littered with legitimate martial arts, like bad dudes that weren't um, weren't actors, right? Yeah. And then and also the movie theater scene where they're fighting show enough, these guys weren't stuntmen. Like stuntmen know how to make it look real without real, without really hitting. But these guys were real martial artists. So they were actually hitting Julius Carey <laughs> 
who wasn't yeah. a real martial artist, but was able yeah. to pull it off. But people thought he was a martial artist because he was such a good method actor. Like he got right yeah. into it. And they trained him like Ron wow. Van Cleef, who was a world champion, like five time world champion martial artist. And it yeah. starred in Hong Kong in <clears throat> big action movies over there. Like they wouldn't give him a shot here. He went over there as a black man. He went there and he was a huge star and they loved him. He was like the first black martial artist star in Hong wow. Kong. And wow. uh, so he was a fight coordinator. He trained Shonuff and he's actually in the seventh heaven fight. Um, you can see him. He's wearing a mask and he's, mm -hmm. has, he's got a chain and he's one of the guys. Yeah. That he's, the guy. yeah he's whipping on, on Bruce Lee. Yeah. That big guy throws him down on the ground and that guy, Gal yeah. Goliath, that giant guy, like he was known for having the biggest world, like the record for the biggest uh, pipes in the world at that time. The guy wow. who picks up Bruce Leroy and slams yeah. him down. So like yeah. everybody is somebody like the Koch brothers yeah. are in there um, who fight. They're wearing shoulder pads and they fight um, Glenn Eaton and Ernie. And I love it. They and, then, and then Ernie, Ernie Reyes Jr. and Ernie Reyes Sr. are in there and they're fighting against each other. Yeah. So right? that, that was a huge moment because yeah, the dad gets to fight son. So dad, uh, coordinated that fight and got to fight his son, which was Ernie. And, you know, at the time, awesome Ernie, Ernie was a big deal. Like that was like, he was brought in late in the production. That's why you don't see him too often in the movie, um, just in that kind of end part. And you don't see him sure. going with Leroy at all, you know, because um, they brought yeah. him in just for that moment. And, uh, yeah, that's that's great. That seven heaven fight scene is, is always stands out to me. There's also a dude with a blowtorch in there. Oh, it's cool. Uh, There's like a I mean, Santa Claus looking like. It was like everything a kid wanted to see in a film was in that movie, yeah. you know, so. <laughs> All right, let's go to number 12. The cast and crew love, they love the film. All these years have gone by. Uh, the film has seen the resurgence of sort of renaissance with new fans and the cast and crew love the film. So there's. Yeah. So they, they really had a good time making it one. Uh, you know, they, like I said before, they had a lot of freedom to ad lib and that sort of thing. And they just now they look back on it as such a good time. And then, and then so many people come up to them of all the big movies they've done. Like Mike Starr always talks, he's been in Goodfellas, all this stuff. And he goes, people will come up to him and he'd be like, the last dragon, you were in the last dragon. And he loves it. He's like, like and sometimes he's been around, he's been out where, you know, the, at a hotel and people know he's a celebrity. So they're like, Oh, can you just leave him alone? And he's like, no, I wanted to talk to him. <laughs> you know? And, um, you know, like, oh, man. when I got, we got, the first time I met these guys was in Detroit and it was, it was 29 years later. And I met Ernie, Glenn and Tyma. And the first time Ernie and, Ernie and uh, Glenn saw each other, the very first thing they did was that little patty cake handshake thing. Yeah. Right off the bat. I and they it. had it. They messed it up like <laughs> just a little bit the first time. Second time they got, they had it down. And I actually recorded it and I have it on my Instagram. That's page. amazing. I'll post it again. Ready? Yeah. Right. I don't am editing this. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> the way they talk to each other is like they're old friends that just picked up right where they left off. Like it was just, we all have such fond Wonderful. memories of it. And um, yeah, that's, that's really great. So, so you, you had mentioned to me that um, someone had told you that Julius Carey actually absolutely loved his role. Can you yeah. shed a little light on that? So I always wondered if he, if Julius Carey, because he died in 2000, 2008, I believe it was, I didn't know if he had realized how much people loved that character because he was always acting. He was busy. He's a pretty serious guy. Briscoe, uh, the Briscoe County Jr. Yeah. I love that show. Yeah. yeah. And he was on like so many sitcoms like uh, <laughs> Murphy Brown and uh, Boy Meets World. He was a dad on that show, one of the parents. And... So, but I got the chance to meet his mother and his mother told me that not only did he, he liked the role, but he talked about it all the time. He knew how much people loved it. And I, I tell you, that made me feel so good. <laughs> I, I could not know what it was. I was just like, that, that was so important to me. Yeah, he no, really it makes me feel it. good to hear that because I feel like knowing that, you know, he passed away too soon. Um, it was, it's like, it makes you feel good to know that that individual, that actor, as a human being, it felt like this, like he knew that something that he contributed to a film like this, that just, you know, that he was happy. He was, uh, he was, he was really enjoyed that role. So that's good to know that. It yeah. makes me, it makes me feel like there's, there's some certain closures that I didn't even know were open right. for me. You know what? That's that, it. You, know? you nailed it. That, that must've been it. What, why that was so important to me. It just gave me 
Yeah. Closure on that because I never did get to meet him, but you know, thankfully I got yeah. to meet his mother. I would have loved to like have a, a beer with him and just kind of chat. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, There's a cool so, like anyway. with him in it. I know. I, I posted <laughs> that. I, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was going to say awesome. his mother and his mother recently passed away too. So, <laughs> oh yeah. no, rest in peace. Sorry Thanks. to hear that. Obviously, Leo wow. O'Brien. You know Denise Matthews, Jonah, Jonah's yeah. mother. Yeah, we've lost some greats from that film. It's yeah. it's unfortunate, but. Fortunately, their their spirit lives on, and uh, we've got this right to remember yeah. them by. But yeah. um, a sequel was actually written back in the '80s. Can you shed a little bit of light on that? Yeah. So it wasn't um, it wasn't Lewis who wrote the sequel. They actually paid him to to go away. I'm not sure why, <laughs> but wow. okay. but it kind of explains you know reasons why it, it didn't get made. So. There was a lot of, you know, just Hollywood things going on. But there was a script. Um, I saw somebody talking about it who read it once. So I, I don't know how true this is. I've never been – I tried to get a hold of this guy. I saw it posted in some forum back in the early, like, 2000s because I've been looking at websites and stuff and found random things all over the Internet, which inspired me to create my own film because I couldn't find all the information I wanted. So I'm like, you know what? I'm yeah. just going to do it myself. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, That's great. But I saw somebody talk about They said it was called, like – Last Dragon 2, The Glow, and it delved more into, you know, the powers of The Glow, like what that, what kind of superpowers that gave Leroy, because it is a superhero movie, you know, you don't right. think of it that way, because he's not a superhero until the end, but when he gets right. the glow, this is yeah. a superhero origin story, really, right? Yeah. So That's it great. goes more into that, like, what The Glow is, and where it came from, and all that sort of stuff. And it just, it didn't end up getting made for, you know, you hear a lot of rumors, there's a lot of things, but like one thing, one rumor is that, you know, Timok held out for more money and he's the jerk that ended all of it. But I mean, they, they completely lowballed him. They gave him like bare minimum for something that was a hit. And, you know, his people rightfully told them, you know, hold out for more. Like they should, if they're going to pay you nothing, which is fine, at least give you back end. So if the right. movie goes well, you can make something. And he said, okay, I'll go. Yeah. And he didn't know what he was doing. If he knew they were going to turn him down, like not even talk to him after that, he wouldn't have done it. So, right. But instead yeah. of negotiating, they just said, oh, really? Done. Wow. And never talked to him again. Like, wow. it's pretty yeah. crazy. And that, that's, all, that's crazy. part of it. So I think, you yeah. know, Barry Gordy had a certain way he wanted to do things. And if, if people, it was his way or the highway. And sure. if it didn't sure. go the way he wanted, he just said, I don't care how much money can be made or, you know, how much fun or how good this is going to be gone. Forget it. Like almost. Yeah, it's too bad. It would have been cool to see something with time, uh, a, a sequel and, and all that. Do you think yeah. a sequel will ever, or, or that universe will ever be expanded? Well, there was, you know, and this is, I hate to get to talk about some of this stuff because fans have been like teased so many times over the years. <laughs> like in 2008, there was, you know, Samuel Jackson was going to be show enough and Chris Brown was going to be Leroy and Rihanna was going to be Laura <laughs> Charles and Rizzo was going to do the music. There was all this stuff and they floated that out there, got a lot of people excited and then nothing. And then there's always talks of this, a remake and people hate the idea of a remake and a sequel. What would do that? But what I can tell you now, and this is why I've been in touch with Luis Benosta, the, uh, the writer, is that he has the rights to future stories. He's written a wow. script. Okay. He's written a script. I've read it. It's, All it's, right. phenomenal. it's phenomenal. Wow. It's, it's a prequel that will lead okay. into other things. And wow. the way he spun it, I don't want to give it away, but it's, 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 it's really great. It, uh, oh, like, man. It's almost like it's kind of meta. It's like The yeah. Last Dragon, the movie was like, and this may change because it's still early, but The Last Dragon movie was like, um, it was a movie about something real that had happened. And but now this is the real. This is what's really happening, and it's going to go back and talk about young wow. Joe and young Leroy. Wow, man, you got me. Uh, you, yeah, you got me pumped on this. I got to somehow read that script, brother. <laughs> yeah, well, when the oh, real man. announcement comes out, we, we can talk yeah. again. We can, That's awesome. We, we'll I talk. love it. I love it. I love that. And Hey, what's up, everybody? That 80s dude here, and I've got a very, very special show lined up for you with a very special guest, uh, Craig Sutton here with me from uh, The Last Dragon Tribute and The Last Glow on social media. How you doing, Craig? 
Very good. Very good. Thanks, man. I love awesome. what you do. <laughs> good the to... fans around this movie are kind of uh, are very much gather around it and promote it and talk about it quite a bit. So I'm seeing a younger audience now really uh, start to embrace this. And I thought it was very important to get you, someone who knows more about this film and has had more communication with the actors and, and crew than anyone else that I know. So before we kick things off, I want to thank you so much for making the time uh, for 80s View TV uh, to talk about a film that we mutually love. And I appreciate your time and all the uh, all the effort and, t and work that you've done behind the scenes um, and for all the fans of this film over the years. So I want to thank you for that, Craig. Thank you. Well, I do it. I do it out of love. I love this movie. I've, I connected with it when I saw the commercial when I was probably nine years old. Nine years old it must have been. I saw the commercial and I, I was sold. Like I said, this guy do. <laughs> I'm like, I want to see That's that. Right. <laughs> and like from that point on, there was something special about it. And of course. I didn't see it till it came out on VHS in uh, probably like 1986. The movie came out in 85, but you know, it took about a year back then for something to come out on VHS and I couldn't wait That's to right. get it, you know? Yeah. And uh, it didn't even come That's to the awesome. movie theater in the town I grew up in. I'm from Canada and uh, okay. in a small town there, it, did, it didn't even come to the theater. So I had to wait. I did it for fun. I built a website years ago, like back in 2009. Um, the first iteration I built in like 1996. And it just grew and grew and grew. And now I hang out with the cast. I talk to uh, Bruce Leroy, Ty Mock. I talk to him all the time on the phone. I talk to the writer. I, you know, I meet most of the cast that's still alive. It's pretty crazy. Love it. Love it. I think this is uh, when you're younger, you don't think you're ever going to be doing that, right? And then no. it suddenly happens. And you, but you know, you gotta, you gotta think we also put things into motion to make things happen. Right. So it's not just, it's not just going to happen to us. Well, it's crazy. Right? You know, you see people say you can manifest goals and things like that. I literally wrote in my high school yearbook for ambition. I said back then, this is 1995 when uh, time Mock had disappeared. The guy who played Bruce Lee got gone. And I put, right. I need to find Leroy Green. That was my ambition. <laughs> and now I'm friends with him. Wow. <laughs> you know? wow. It's crazy. That's and amazing, I, man. Total whim I wrote that, right? I love the movie. It was yeah. just amazing. But it was yeah. a funny thing to say, right? I was just trying to be funny, really. Uh, but at uh, the same time, it's something I really wanted to do. And uh, here I we go. I feel you. I feel you. That's awesome, man. I love hearing that kind of story. Well, let me uh, share with the audience, um, for me, for my experience, real quick, before I kind of give an introduction to The Last Dragon and a little historical perspective. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, all through the 80s. So when The Last Dragon, I saw the first, I actually saw The Last Dragon, if I recall correctly, it was like in a paper clipping on the, as I was walking to school, just papers kind of like, it was almost like magical. It was like papers uh, all over the floors and stuff. In Detroit, you walk to school quite a bit with a group of friends so you wouldn't get jumped. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, there was all sorts of magazine clippings that were like, you know, torn up pages and stuff all over the, the, the shrubbery, the trees and stuff. And it was just kind of a dirty place. But I, I do remember seeing a clipping um, and it was back then the newspaper printing was not like today's, like clean and, and all that. Mm -hmm. It was like almost like uh, aberrated, like it was weird. But I could tell it just said in this in the logo, it said, and it was like a, a stencil logo, The Last Dragon. And I was like, what is this? Uh, and, and basically, it was kind of like the last I'd seen of it for a little while. Um, and I know that I heard about it in Detroit. Because, you know, obviously, Motown. Uh, like you, I didn't see it on, in the theaters. I saw it like after it came out on VHS. And I'm going to share something with you that I didn't get until a few years later. But it is something that I'm not too proud of today. But I, I got to say, I am kind of proud that I have it. But I have an actual original um, from a uh, just a mom and pop video rental store I that I, I actually kept and never returned. All right. <laughs> of, the last, <laughs> of the last dragon right here Amazing. in this ugly uh, brown, uh, you know, plastic. Take a look at that. Right. Nice. It even has the uh, it even has the name of the video store and the uh, location and all that. So I'm not going to show it because I don't want like the owner or their kids <laughs> to find out, but I probably owe like about $2 million just on this and, and, and late fees. Yeah. Um, but this That's is, um, take a look at that. When the VHS tapes were textured, yeah. like hard, you know what I mean? And yeah, it, well, it doesn't I have the spine remember. label. I totally yeah, it doesn't have the spine that. label, but it has, it has a very nice main label right here. 
Yeah. And um, yeah, man, I ended up like doing whatever I could to keep this VHS tape because it was like impossible to get this this among a few other tapes like um like the monster squad and they were very tough to um to yeah. get you know what it's i mean so times. i had to times. i had to figure out how to get those vhs tapes and i was i grew up dirt poor so i i just was trying to you know but i gotta say i think i made it up in in uh in being good to people and just being good in life over the years so i think you know <laughs> i'm okay but i just love the, the thing that, that I love about this for me, about the last this last Dragon VHS tape, is you remember they used to do a lot of cut boxes. So they would actually take the artwork and cut it so they would fit it on the spine. They would fit it on the back like it was centered. Mm -hmm. This one, they took the actual artwork and they just opened this up, laid it in, and didn't cut it. So I'm very, very lucky. I could pull wow. this out right now. And I've got That's awesome. a very beautiful, full-on box yeah. of the last dragon artwork really? we right gotta get that sign we gotta get that sign for you dude yeah i really do man i mean, I mean yeah. it's so special and the other thing i'm not i don't have showing here you see a top you see a um a iron eagle poster here behind yes. me i was gonna i Love was gonna it. lay out the um the last dragon poster i actually have an original of the last dragon poster but that poster is actually massive it's a little bit bigger than this and i i didn't want to take it out because it's very kind of like uh, on some of the uh, on some of the bins, uh, it's a little bit. Um, it's got a little like nicking and stuff like that. So I didn't want to like take it out and not put it right into a frame. So I'm looking. I've been searching for a frame for like probably over a year for this thing, and um, and yeah. So so I'm gonna get it framed eventually. I'll send a photo of it once I do to you. And uh, <laughs> nice. But yeah, I'm very yeah. proud of this uh, in my collection. And then the last thing I'll say is I also picked up. Uh, I ended up pre-ordering the Last Dragon 4K, which just yeah. was recently released. Actually, just dropped. Yeah, so, um, so I can't wait to unbox this and open it up and do a video on it. Um, Great. But it looks like it's got uh, a few special features, uh, fan commentary, uh, as and the commentary by Michael Schultz. Uh, mm -hmm. Return of the Dragon: A Look at the Making and Legacy of Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon, featuring Tymok. Barry Gordy and more. So I'm kind of excited to see all this. Yeah. Um, I think it might be the same stuff. Some of the stuff from the 30th anniversary Blu-ray, but okay. there's some new okay. commentary from. Um, yeah, I didn't. Um, I didn't purchase the 30th anniversary one for whatever reason. Uh, but lately, I've been getting into steel books, so I I couldn't pass this one up. Um, yeah, that's and great. Had to get it, but yeah. But anyway, so that's my that's my background about uh, the Last Dragon, and I once I saw the film. I, I got to tell you, it, it really did change my life because I got into martial arts not long after that. Um, and I, I think I took a, from, from the time I saw that film all the way through the early 2000s, I was fairly, I was on and off, but mostly on in martial arts. Yeah. And I, I really do contribute, uh, attribute that to seeing this film. Yeah. There's and, a lot of people uh, that say just, that. Yeah. A lot. Yeah, of and, 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 a lot I've of heard people. a lot of people say that. For yeah, sure. For sure. Uh, it's good. <laughs> so the film, the film, interestingly, cost approximately ten million dollars, as far as I understand. It made thirty-three million dollars, some odd uh, change. Is mm -hmm. that what you understand too? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. back in the day, especially that was, I mean, anytime that's quite a uh, financial success, and that was a pretty yeah, big blockbuster for a martial arts movie back then. And even it for didn't sure. get the kind of promotion that it, you know, that nowadays you'd think it would deserve. With the following it had they had some issues that they, they kind of thought it would be like more of an urban like black culture movie so they didn't really want to promote it in, into a wider audience so you know it, it could have done a lot better I, I i agree with you on that and i was i wanted to chat with you about that and get your feedback so like there were a lot of critical reviews back in 1985 that i was able to pull up uh through the mm -hmm. uh interverse right mm -hmm. and i think the critics come a lot of them completely got this film wrong yeah. Um, and, and with all due respect, I mean, I don't want to like talk down to some of these critics who have been watching film for a long time, but I think the demographic of critics that were critiquing this particular film didn't watch, you know, a Kung Fu theater like you and I did, or weren't immersed in that culture. And therefore, when I was reading some of these, um, they were, every single one of them almost looked like they were taking off a boilerplate of each other and calling this, calling him a karate master. First of all, 
the 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 idea of that is is just completely ludicrous to me because if you watched uh if you grew up in that culture and you watched kung fu films you would realize that there is a um dichotomy here there's there's almost like a, a kung fu versus karate or different types of martial arts um, mm -hmm. coming together and opposing each other. So Bruce Leroy represents to me uh, who Bruce Lee was, and right. that was a kung fu uh, martial artist, right. whereas um, Shonuff was a karate guy, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Japanese. It was a Japanese. He wore the Japanese symbols, and it was totally – he was a samurai. It was like an urban samurai versus – the Bruce Lee characters, and they all dressed in the in a Chinese outfit. So absolutely, yeah, I'm yeah. glad you caught that. Not a lot of people yeah, see absolutely. that. Yeah, well, thank you. And, and you know, it's interesting, Roger Ebert, he liked the film, right? And yeah. Roger Ebert, I grew up, and I would watch Siskel and Ebert, like, on TV, right? Remember, you would, like, try to watch that so that yeah. you knew it was going on. And even if I got, like, a clip of a trailer or something, I would, to me, that was almost like being in the theater. Um, yeah. And and so, like, he got it right. He gave the film two and a half stars, which is actually back then pretty good because he is known for four star reviews, right? Um, and and but he made the mis he also made the mistake of referring to Timok as a karate master. Uh, Janet Maslin from the New York Times does the very same thing, and another popular critic from the time, Paul An Anatasio, he was um, with the Washington Post. He also liked the film, but he, he also described it wrong. Um, in, the, in, a, in an article I remember reading, it was called Rooting for the Dragon. Um, so for me, was the, was the reason why, I know that the, the film still had success on video, but I really feel like it could have been a $100 million movie had the critics and, and maybe the marketing been better or actually more understood. And, and you know, like, I'll give you an example. The Chicago Tribune uh, uh, writers c uh, called this film described it as a romantic comedy. Now it has that, right? Mm -hmm. It has a romance in it and there's some co comic comedy in it, yeah. but I think they got it wrong, right? Yeah, so I mean, in, in their defense, it was new. It was very unique. It, like, it, it, it was a callback to a lot of old things and like the hero's journey and kung fu films like you talked about, but at the same time, it was comedy. It was action. It was, you know, satire. It was, you know, so many new things all combined it was a fairy tale. It was a musical. Like, yeah. how do you describe yeah. it, right? So it, people just didn't get it, especially those older are used to a certain style of movie. They just, they didn't know what to call it. And the people behind it, not everyone, but like the executives didn't know how to promote it. They didn't know what to do. So, and that's, I agree, I agree that's with you. often how ter films turn into cult status because fans don't care about all that stuff. They watch it. They like it. They enjoy it. It makes them feel good. You want to watch it again, and that's this. This is a feel-good kind of movie that uh, it, it hits home for so many people. You don't have to be, you know, yeah, a karate guy, a karate kung fu guy, a karate martial arts. You don't have, but yeah. martial arts love it. You, it's about a lot of black people are in, it, but it's not only black people that love this movie. It's, it's right. everything. It's got so much to it. It's got a lot of different cultures. Yeah. In it. It's just, it's fun. I love that. I love that. And leading up to this interview with you, I actually was able to listen to quite a few podcasts. There are, you'd be surprised how many podcasts there are uh, titled uh, Bad Movie yeah. Podcasts, or like, like that's their reference. And, and I hate to say that they would take such a film and include that in their, in their you know, episodes. You know, it's, I, it's, it, it, we feel the same way about a lot of this. Like, it's really interesting. I almost feel like people have to call it bad because... They feel like it's a guilty pleasure. They feel like it's like, if I like this, it means I'm corny or whatever because it's, you know, it's 80. It's 80s. 80s was sure. a different time. It was a little bit of cheese, yeah. big hair, yeah. you know. For sure. So they're kind of like, I know inside I love this, but I don't want to admit that I really like it. So I'm going to say right. it. I'm going to hedge what I'm saying with. It's the best bad movie out there. It's the best. Right, right. No, it's, it's, it, if you look at it now. You compare it to other movies that came out in 85, 84, 86, the quality that it has compared to that, even good movies like Never, No Retreat, No Surrender, it's a good movie. Sure. But still, yeah. you look at the quality of it. The Last Dragon is levels yeah. above it. The execution oh, yeah. of those – yeah, I, I think what this, what The Last Dragon does that really saves it as well – and makes it stand out if you're going to say if you're going to include it in like a subgenre of of martial arts you know bad flicks or whatever it is which I disagree with yeah. is its execution it really has uh fantastic cuts 
uh, where some things are like, it just does things better. Like I do yeah. like no retreat, no surrender. I, it, I as it. cheesy as that movie is, the execution yeah. is not done well. Like, like they do it here. Yeah, it, in doesn't the last dragon. it doesn't stand up like the last dragon still can. Right. There's moments For in sure. it where it's like, okay, that's a little cheesy, but it's not, it's like yeah. I said, it's, it's levels above it. It's, I and agree. It, and it, knows, what, it knows it's a, it's a little tongue in cheek what it's doing. Like it's rare. It's not like people totally. try to make fun of it sometimes. Like, oh, how could they do that? But it's like, no, it's yeah. doing that on purpose. Like it knows what it's doing. You nailed it. You nailed it. Yeah. The podcast I was listening to recently, and I have nothing against it. I'm not going to name it, but I, I think what they did make a point was one, one of the areas I disagreed was, hey, the, the, yeah, they said if they tweak this and tweak this and became more serious about this, I'm like, no, you. That's the point. The point is, is that it doesn't take itself seriously, right. um, but it takes all these tropes certainly. But it's so entertaining. The one thing they got right that I really did agree with was these guys watched this film for the first time and they loved the film. And they were like, this is a film that is unlike a lot of these bad movies that we watch and we mm -hmm. critique. And I would watch this many, many times and I'm going to show it to my kids. Yeah. So that to me is why this is the every every person's movie. Yeah. Right. The, cr yeah. the critics got it wrong. But people like you and me, just st people who love movies and love film. This is the film. This is the film. This is it. You know, it stands the test of time. You know, yeah. I don't think this could be made today, to be honest with you. I certainly don't think it could be made in this way. Certainly not for that budget. It's a, it's a very special film. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so that said, uh, the characters in The Last Dragon are special. Every single one of them has some sort of story that could probably be like tangentially told in a, di mm -hmm. in a, in a different movie, right? So, so, so tell me, I'm just going to kind of like a fun question. Who are you like, give me your three favorite uh, characters or, or series of characters in the film. Well, just obviously, the obviously uh, Leroy, you know, amazing. Like he, um, I connected with him, you know, I, I was different. I felt different. I'm, I'm black and white mixed similar to him in real life. Um, and I always felt like I could fit in anywhere, but not anywhere at the same time. And so and sure. people expect you to have certain stereotypes and live up to this and live up to that. Or like, well, are you white or are you black? And or do you act like a black person? <laughs> or do you act like a white? Like weird right. questions when you're a kid, right? Yeah. And then I saw yeah. this guy just doing his own thing and he didn't care what anyone else had to say. He was into what he was into. And I was into martial arts movies. Not I did a little, but not serious. And I was into like, you know, Michael Jackson music back then. And, he looked right. like he was Michael Jackson doing Kung Fu. I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> you know, I was into Star Wars, of course, a huge Star Wars fan. And so, like, yeah. it has some of that magic and, you know, fantasy that, that Star Wars has, that feel of it. it. You know, the whole, the hero's journey, it's the same story, right? This story, yeah. you know, someone refuses at first and doesn't understand what they're doing. And then they meet, they meet a master and they have to find a new man. It's all the same story that's told a million different ways in, in The Matrix it. and... Star Wars and The Hobbit and you name it. Like all the greatest films yeah. follow this story. And so does The Last Dragon to a T. And it does it in a beautiful and fun way. So Leroy won. Um, show enough of Harlem. I'm just going to go like, you know. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. no surprises here. Like show enough is yeah. incredible. Like I literally feel like he's the greatest villain of all time. Like the guy needs yeah. to be up there with Darth Vader you know, Jaws, Scarface, <laughs> you know, yeah, the guy is incredible for sure. what he did. And, you know, and, yeah. and that's another thing when you talk about critics and people that may not be into the movie, no one will ever say they didn't like Show Enough. They're like, if anything, they're like, yeah. Show Enough should have been on the screen more. And, yeah. but, you know, you might not like the villain as much if, if you show too much. You know, he Agreed. was a little reserved. And I heard one review yeah. say he was like very, um, what is it, um, one sided, you know, one dimensional. I don't think that at okay. all. I think right. there's there's a side to him you can see. Like, he's not just an evil villain. He wants to prove that he's the best. And he won't even... He's trying to get Leroy to fight him one-on-one, -on -one, legitimately. He's not trying to trick him or do something dirty to him. He's legitimately disappointed when he goes to kiss his converts. He's like... And he won't even let him do it. He doesn't let him do it. He kicks him in the face because right. he's like, dude, come on. I expected more of you. You're you're good. I know you can fight. Let's do this. Come on. Let's show. You know, yeah. he wanted to bring out the best in Leroy. Either. Also, I mean, he's not, he's a bad guy, but 
there's more to them than just that maniacal, yeah. ah, I'm going to destroy you, you know, like. I agree with you. If I can comment on that, you make an excellent point about that. I think a lot of people miss the thing about Shonoff is you can see it in several scenes where he is. He has complexity. Now, one of the scenes that stood out to me initially when I when I watched this film and then rewatch, rewatch, rewatch is the Data Green's pizza scene um, where he's in there with his crew and he's saying something and they they sort of instinctively say Shonoff. Well, yeah. he kind of gives them this, like, this is not the time. Yeah. yeah right? Yeah. If you catch that look that he makes, it's very nuanced. But you can tell that he's just like, there's a time and place for this kind of stuff. But I'm just here to say, hey, I'm taking, I'm, this is personal to me. And therefore, I need to get my point across to his parents. I was told I could find Leroy Green here. Leroy Green? Who are you? Who am I? Shut up! up. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the fact that he, sure. I mean, it's obvious, like, he wouldn't take the money to fight Bruce Lee, right? They offer him a whole briefcase of money, and he's like, nah, I don't want it. I just want to just yeah. get him somewhere, and I'm going to kick his ass. <laughs> right. But I think he does have a sense of honor uh, I agree. that I agree. he portrays. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He, did, he does things in shady ways. Like, he destroyed his, his family's, uh, Leroy's family's pizza shop. Like, you know, right. he's bad. He's a bad guy. Yeah. But, but, yeah. Yeah, but bad. you know... A street code, like a street code of honor, you know. A little right. different. I agree. Honor, you know, I agree. And if you watch, if you grew up watching the Chinese Connection, Fist of Fury, back then, they would, and in films they would portray this, but they were like challenges from school to school, uh, yeah. fighter to fighter. And so this is a one of those classic challenge movies where it's like, oh well, I'm better than you, so let's let's go out and let's prove it. You know what I mean? And yeah. it was like, a, it was one of those things that just happened. And if you grew up in the 80s, martial arts was huge. It was huge. And, um, and thanks to yeah. Bruce Lee, obviously. That's another thing people don't realize, too. How big martial arts was at that time. Yeah. And how crazy people love to see this movie. Like, think of all the other movies in the 80s that were all martial arts that you don't see anymore now. Right. right? And right. it was a crazy time. And people were, like... That's like we're going to talk about like that's what inspired this movie when the writer sat in a theater, an anniversary showing of Enter the Dragon. He looked around and he was like, these people love this. Like they're insane. He liked it, too. He was a fan. But and people were dressed up like people were like, oh, that's crazy. Movie theaters were never like that. Yeah, mid New York in, yeah. uh, in New York Times yeah. Square was not the Disneyland it is now. It was a seedy, you know, there yeah. was. You would go into a theater, I'm sure. I wasn't there, but I've heard there would be drugs being sold, smoked. You know, there's yeah. people eating chicken out of the box. There, you know, people yeah. dancing in the aisles, yelling, time. At, yelling at the screen. That, yeah. And he saw people dressed up in kung fu outfits, and he's like, there's a movie here. There's something, right? So tell me who your third uh, just that oh. comes to mind. Yeah, well, that's a little harder, but um, there's because there's so many now. Like, it's kind of so many characters on the same level, kind of thing. But, um, I mean, I'm going to have to go with Laura Charles with, um, you know, I picked the three biggest ones, right? <clears throat> but yeah, um, she was just just something. Like, on, she's just beautiful. She's such a huge you know, presence. Such a presence. Absolutely. Yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah, but I, mean, I also think she lent, she lent um, a, a vulnerability and also a, a strong uh, female presence in the film as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she just had so, that, like... That flirtatious vibe, but it was like, I, I, even a kid, it felt clean. It didn't feel, now right. I would know differently, but, but then, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It felt yeah, like, that's oh, awesome. wow, well, that's great. Well, beautiful. for me, definitely um, uh, Bruce Leroy. Uh, I think Ty Mock was awesome as him. And like yeah. you, I I very much associated with, um, with him. I mean, I was an immigrant, first generation to the country. So for me, you know, growing up there, there was, uh, you know, kind of like assimilating uh this is an area that i i can have some brotherhood you know in martial arts and maybe mm -hmm. find something there for me you know so definitely a huge fan of uh bruce leroy's character in time um i really enjoyed johnny Yu, uh oh, or played yeah. by Glenn that's, yeah that would that's be one of my favorite for, yeah he's incredible yeah <laughs> yeah one of my favorite characters in fact i really think that character could have his own movie 
Yep. And um, it would be pretty fun to see on on in, in his own, like at least like little series, like a mini series or something. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, um, definitely Glenn Eaton's character, Johnny Yu. Uh, show enough. Um, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, I think that without show enough, I'm not sure the last dragon would be the last dragon, right? You yeah. need, no, that, you're right. He, 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 he was just such an, not only over the top, but also such a magnificent presence for the film yeah. that uh, to me, he was a, integral to, to the movie and the success of that film. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I would say also uh, obviously vanity, wonderful, but I also loved um, Faith Prince. Um, yeah. I think uh, her character, there are scenes there where she like is crying. She, she's, she's like, it's, it's, it's wonderful acting. And, yeah, it's her and first role too. It's, she's taken for granted, I think, in the film. Yeah, you know? it's her first role. So, that was her first like major role. The time I had no acting experience. Okay. Vanity, right. uh, Denise Matthews. I call her De Denise Matthews because she preferred before yeah. she died, she was referred to be called that. But whatever. Um, she had never really acted. She'd done video. She, no, sorry, she'd done some stuff, but not a lot of experience. She'd done, she'd done a bunch of movies actually. Yeah, small, small stuff. Yeah. Well. Well, certainly there's a lot of other characters we could have mentioned, the Sum Dumb Goy guys. I mean, yeah. they're, they're just like, to me, a character of their own. We'll talk about them in just a day. Uh, <laughs> Tell me a little bit about what's coming up for you. You've got the Last Dragon 40th Anniversary, a celebration coming up with uh, Urban Action Showcase and yeah. Expo. I think it's happening next year. Yeah, so uh, Demetrius Angelo runs the, the Urban Action Showcase Expo in uh, New York every year in November. And every year he has, Time Hawk is there every year, which they're doing this year, November again. And um, I'll probably be a link to this in your comments um, to get tickets for that or to see what that's yes. all about. Yeah, I'll add that to the description below for sure. Yeah, so that's every year. But then next year is leading into the 40th anniversary. So 2024, 2025 will be the 40th. But he always kicks it off, you know, in the year before, at the end of the right. year. The fourth anniversary, and I believe you were at the thirty fifth or the thirtieth. I I was at the thirty fifth. The thirty fifth, which was oh yeah. man, was it, was that not fun? That was so awesome. I loved it. Had a great time. I carved out, I think a full day, yeah, uh, half day or whatever to to that. Yeah, uh, and I had a blast. I got to hear the actors um, chatting. You even got to ask some questions. Yeah, it was a blast. Yeah, I mean, we did a Q and A. We showed the movie, packed theater. You know, it was awesome. We did the thirtieth. Five years before, we actually even had a guy dressed up as show enough, like interrupt the the, the, the showing and come <laughs> in. And yell That's and awesome. And he yelled that time off who's in the crowd. Like it was just awesome. And all That's of this great. was surreal because I literally sat there in the theater, you know, 30 years later, sitting beside Time Hawk and his family, watching my favorite movie with my hero. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah, yeah, so they do this the 40th anniversary. So the plan is to make it even bigger than the 30th, bigger than the 35th. Get every yep. living cast member and as many people out as we can. Get fans to meet them. Fire off questions. Wow. Just have fun. And they're all fun guys. They're not like they're not like the Hollywood like stay back kind of people like sign and go. They're all like very welcoming. Involved. They're involved. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you can tell. Yeah, yeah. that's so awesome. I, I, great this experience. is something that I gotta put down and maybe try to create a line item budget for because I really would love to come out there in person to see if I could pull that off, but. Certainly, um, you guys watching this, you're going to see it in the description below. So make sure you click the link and check it out. Uh, I had a wonderful time at the event. Uh, and I think that if you're a fan of this film, you should be, you should do this like 100%. Yeah, it's, it's held yeah. at, and they show it at a movie theater that is literally across the street from where they film the the movie theater scenes in The Last Dragon. Oh, that's that, so that good. Is the, that's the Victory so good. Theater, right? Right there. Yeah. In the yeah. Like, that's so good, man. It's crazy. Well, well, listen, Craig, you have been so gracious with your time and, and your your knowledge and just your experiences with all the actors and crew and, and just behind the film. And I really appreciate what you've done uh, to keep this film in the limelight. It really deserves it. And I, you know, for all of you watching, please make sure that you follow Last Glow on Instagram is where I mostly I'm in touch with you. And then obviously check out the Last Dragon mm -hmm. Tribute online. And by the way, I got I to gotta order a couple shirts from your um, shop on there. I think yeah. I saw you had some apparel there. We got and, some of those. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh nice. Yeah, dude. Oh, look at that. A bunch of people. That's this awesome. Is, this is an old one, but yeah. 
I just I love it. I love it. Yeah. So so no. So um, thank you so much, Craig. And I, I just want to leave the audience with this. You know, at the beginning of the movie, uh, Bruce Leroy's master talks about uh, the facets that are part of the last dragon cycle that they must exist to achieve the final level. You remember that, right, Craig? Uh, and they are what? Vengeance, fear and love. Right. These are yeah. needed to break through the wall of mystery, yeah. uh, you know, to the glow. So interestingly, in the final scene, and this is what I'm going to leave you all with, uh, Leroy Green actually experiences all of these in a matter of moments, right, Craig? Yeah. Uh, when he's being dipped into the uh, the vat with the water, show enough forces Bruce's head, uh, Bruce Leroy's head in the water the third time, and it's uh, the first time it's his brother, right? Is we we kind of cut to his brother being held uh, hostage, right? And he's like, the you second coward. is, uh, <laughs> what's that? And is that the part where he calls him a coward, you coward? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the second one is of his master actually uh, yeah. saying something to him. And then the third one is basically of Laura Charles. She so his, that, that, yeah, it, exactly. And mm. when he's pulled out, he's sort of that whole, like the, all those facets kind of converge into that moment where he says, I am right. Yeah. Uh, still get goosebumps. And, and so still, still get goosebumps. Yeah, me too. Me too. Man. Yeah. Um, please don't forget to subscribe and like, and uh, I'll see you in the next retrospective. Um, and one other thing, the secret awaits eyes unclouded by ambition, right? All Absolutely. right, you guys. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, at the last dragon tribute, the last glow. Stay rad, you guys. Peace. All right. <laughs> Oh, my God.